Cindy Song was born in South Korea in 1980. When she was 15, she moved to Virginia to live with her aunt and uncle. Once she graduated high school, she attended Penn State University. During Halloween in 2001, she went to a costume party at Players Night Club with two close friends, Stacy Pack and Lisa Kim. They all partied until 2 a.m. the next morning, and then stopped off at a friend's apartment to play video games. Once they dropped her off at 4 a.m., Cindy was never seen again. Her apartment was investigated and found no signs of foul play. However, they did find the eyelashes she wore along with her backpack and cell phone. Her purse that had her driver's license and credit cards were missing along with the costume she wore the night before. They checked her phone and found that no calls were made or received after the time she was dropped off, nor was there any activity on her credit cards. The Penn State campus was searched and found no trace of her. It is believed that she didn't run off due to concert tickets being found at her apartment that would take place not too long after her disappearance. It's believed by authorities that she went to a 24-hour supermarket and was abducted there or on the way there. A few days later, a woman who looked like her was seen in Philadelphia being forced into a car. The man who did it is unknown and police aren't sure whether or not that was Cindy. This happened at Philadelphia's Chinatown District, 200 miles from where she lived. In 2003, her disappearance was connected to a bank robber and suspected serial killer Hugo Solinsky. A co-defendant of Solinsky's told the police that Hugo and an accomplice kidnapped and killed a woman from the college that looked a lot like Cindy. None of the DNA taken from the five bodies that were found on Solinsky's property was Cindy's. One of the bodies was of his accomplice Michael Kirkowski. Solinsky confessed to kidnapping Cindy, but told the police that Kirkowski was the one that killed her. Surprisingly, Solinsky was acquitted of the murders of the two bodies that were found on his property. However, he was convicted of abusing their corpses. In January 2014, seven other bodies were found on his property, but they still have yet to link any one of them to Cindy. In 2015, Solinsky was convicted of the murders of Kirkowski and his girlfriend, Tammy Fasick. He was sentenced to life in prison. He's still a suspect, but Cindy's body has never been found. Don Henry and Kevin Knives were high school friends who lived in Bryan, Arkansas. After midnight on August 23, 1987, both Kevin and Don were out hunting in the wooded area along the tracks near Don's home. Hours later, a cargo train made its regular run to Little Rock, Arkansas. It was over a mile long and traveling over 50 miles per hour. As it approached Bryan, the engineer, Stephen Schroyer, saw something on the tracks. Then he realized the two boys laid motionless on them. The boys were identified as Kevin and Don. They appeared to be covered by a green tarp with a 22 rifle beside them. Stephen tried to blow his diesel horn several times and got no reaction. He then attempted to stop, but it was too late and ran over both Don and Kevin. The medical examiner determined that Kevin and Don were under the influence of marijuana and had smoked about 20 marijuana cigarettes. He believed that they were in a drug-induced coma at the time they were hit. The death was originally ruled to be accidental. However, their families were certain that they were murdered and did not believe they were involved in any sort of drugs. Kevin's family hired a private investigator, and every time he questioned police, he was met with resistance. They seemed unwilling to cooperate or change their opinion. About it. Five months later, both Kevin and Don's parents held a press conference in hopes of getting the case reopened, and it worked with the getting reopened the next day. New pathologists found that they had smoked between one and three marijuana cigarettes, much less than originally thought to be true. He also found that one of them was already dead and the other unconscious when they were hit by the train. In July of 1988, a grand jury reversed the ruling of accidental death and changed it to probable homicide. Six weeks after it was reopened, a similar case occurred in Hodgson, Oklahoma, where two bodies were found lying on railroad tracks and hit while lying in the same position as Kevin and Don. However, no suspects were found in connection with those deaths. A week before Kevin and Don's death, an unknown man wearing military fatigues was spotted near the train tracks. His behavior was noted as being very suspicious. When police officer questioned him, the individual opened fire, and when the area was searched, he was never found. On the night of the deaths, people saw a man in military fatigues. This time, he was leaving town. Police had been unable to locate or identify him. A prosecutor by the name of Richard Garrett had another autopsy done on both Kevin and Don, and found evidence of stab wounds on Don's shirt 
and Kevin was struck in the head with a rifle butt. This resulted in the case being changed from probable to definite homicides. Several tips have been given over the years, but unfortunately, on October 23, 2018, Garrett passed away at the age of 72 without acquiring any resolution to the case. Catherine Kazilius was six years old, living in a good neighborhood in Austin, Texas. On August 7, 1996, her mother, along with herself and brother, stopped to pick up the mail on our way home. Catherine asked if she could walk home, and her mother thought it was fine. She knew it was her way of saying that she was ready to be more independent, and it was something that she had did before. Her mother drove one way, while Catherine walked home in the other direction, which was the shorter of the two ways, being less than a quarter of a mile. Her brother said that he had not seen Catherine at home. After being told to look for her, he could still not find her. They even tried their neighbors, and they didn't see her either. Minutes later, the mother found Catherine's body lying in the street. Still alive, her mother picked her up and drove her to the hospital. She was put on a ventilator to keep her breathing, but she was brain dead. She was pronounced dead at 11.30 p.m. that night. It was originally theorized that she was a victim of a hit-and-run driver, but as police searched for a suspect, other disturbing theories came to light. A medical examiner determined that Catherine had not died from a hit-and-run, but rather from jumping, being thrown, or falling from a moving car. The injuries sustained were consistent with that theory. It was also thought that maybe she had tried to hold on to the back of her mother's car on the ride home, but had fallen off. Private investigator Barbara O'Brien, who had been hired by the family, noted that it was a hot August day and it would have been difficult for Catherine to hold on to the back of the car. Her thumb was also in a splint, which would have made it much more difficult for her to hold on to anything. Her mother noted that when she found Catherine, she was laid out for her to find. Her hair was smoothed down, her shirt was straight, and her sandals were kept on. Her family hopes one day for more new info, but as of yet, no new suspects have been identified. John Bon Jovi, who was managed by Catherine's father, wrote a song dedicated to her called August 7th, 415, which was the date and time of Catherine's death. Catherine's brother later became a senior deputy for the Travis County Sheriff's Office. Sadly, he died in a car accident on March 18, 2020 was just 32 years old. Thanks for checking out this video. Please subscribe as I put out new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter at DanScares and Instagram at DanSMachinaYT. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.